2023 committee of a whole meeting of a of a regular village board of trustees. Our clerk, please call the roll. Trustee Ankerman. Here. Trustee Marquis. Here. Trustee Rappin. Here. Trustee Ryder. Here. Thank you. Next item three is our non-agenda items and visitors for public comments. The committee of the whole allocates 15 minutes during this item for those individuals who would like the opportunity to address the committee of the whole on any matter not listed on the agenda. Each person addressing the committee of the whole is asked to limit their comments to a maximum of three minutes. I do not see anybody willing to make a comment. Do we have anybody online? We do have one participant online has not raised her hand to um, talk during this time. Thank you. Next is our general business. Um, the committee of the whole will entertain requests from anyone present to modify the order of business to be conducted. Um, any request? None being received. <laughs> Thank you. And moving on to our consideration of the minutes from the December 12, 2022 committee of the whole meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Thank you. A second. second. Thank you. Uh, are there any changes in this document? No. I had a small wording change that I shared with Drew <coughs> earlier today. Yeah. Simple typo. Yep. yep. Thank you. Uh, clerk, <coughs> please call the roll. It's roll. i uh, voice vote. Uh, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Um, and we have disapproved. Next is our uh, discussions regarding bu building code requirements uh, for fire sprinklers. Thank you. Hi, as most of you know, I'm Mike Croak, building code supervisor. Um, and so I was last here to talk to you about fire sprinklers on um, December 12th, and uh, we talked about the history of how our uh, retrofit requirement came about. This is a requirement that requires um, multifamily and commercial buildings to um, retrofit for fire sprinklers by January 1st, 2026. Um, we first adopted a uh, retrofit requirement in 2005 and then moved the date back by 15 years in 2010. And I, I shared with you the um, statistics and report from the National um, Fire Protection Association on um, deaths and fires and, and the fire sprinklers um, at that time. Um, and we talked about two different things. We talked about um, possibly amending our code to create an exemption process that people could apply for. This is the existing code uh, here with the 2026 date. Um, we talked about, um, you know, how that could apply to uh, buildings, you know, where it didn't really necessarily make a lot of sense to install fire sprinklers like ComEd's uh, electrical um, building or the park district's uh, restroom building down on the beach and that buildings that might have unusual costs or unusual situations involved in installing sprinklers. So. Um, Based on that discussion, uh, there's a uh, draft ordinance, I'm sure you've all read in your packet there, that sets some criteria um, and allows you know, anyone who uh, is subject to the, the 2026 retrofit date to apply if they believe they can make a case that they uh, meet those criteria. Um, the other thing we talked about was open-sided structures um, that um, you know, that we talked about exempting them from the requirement, and um, there isn't anything on that in your packet, but I do intend to include that in the, uh, the draft amendments to our local amendments to the International Building Code. Um, we saw some text last time on the screen, and it was, it's, this has been changed slightly, but we're thinking of something like uh, exempting existing open-sided freestanding structures of less than 5,000 square feet. Um, in the process for both of these are, um, we're planning to roll them into our building code amendments that I expect um, will go to the Architectural Board of Review, if everything goes well, in um, March for their public hearing on it, and they would make a recommendation back to the Village Board on everything. 
Um, as far as additional research we've done since the December meeting, um, we did survey um, neighboring communities and um, all of our neighbors really um, require existing unsprinkled buildings to upgrade as part of the remodeling process rather than by a certain date. Um, and they all have various amendments that make the um, international existing building code more stringent or eliminate that um, caveat in, in that international code that um, doesn't require the retrofit at remodeling if, uh, if, if there's not an existing water service of enough size. So they all have, have more stringent codes than that. Um, two of them, Lake Forest and Libertyville, do have some provisions for people to apply for exemptions and interpretations of that. And those are both done by um, staff committee. And I, I think one reason they both do that is because um, you know, on remodeling, there's always a judgment call as to how how, to, how you define how significant the remodeling is because it's not always as simple as the square footage because someone could be doing a small amount of work that's still spread over a large square footage versus someone could do a very large amount of work too. Um, we've also tried to research uh, costs. Um, there's a good graphic in your packet um, on the uh, page 43 of that retrofit guide. They have a good chart. Unfortunately, it's way too uh, grainy of a resolution to enlarge and, and put up on the wall. But um, What page did you say that was? That's on page 43 of that packet. Um, you know, one, one of the things they said in that retrofit guide, which I think is very wise words, is that it's hard to generalize about the cost on retrofitting because it's very unique to the building type and the, the building um, design and a lot of the particulars of the building. And I would add to that also estimates can also be very particular to a lot of uh, factors like how busy a contractor is at the moment they're giving the estimate to. Um, but they did include some numbers in case studies in that guide and those costs range anywhere from $244 per square foot to $1022 per square foot. Um, it looked like the low rise two and three story buildings were toward the higher end of the cost there. Do you know, I, what, do you know what date these numbers are from? Um, they do have the, I thought they had the years on the chart. Um, yeah, the second, uh, second column from the left is the years there, so. I see, yeah. so the fairly dated numbers. Yeah, right, there's some 2013, 2014 there. Um, I also talked to Lake Forest, which has numbers they use um, that they got from a survey of contractors and they use them as minimums because they're basing the uh, the permit fee cost on the cost of construction mm -hmm. so they want to have a minimum to know if, if someone's unrealistically low and their their numbers that they're using which are also a couple years old since they've done the survey it's um a dollar 75 for a new house um in dollars per square foot for sprinklering 375 for light hazard commercial like retail and five dollars per square foot for industrial, and that includes, you know, as part of the remodeling process. Um, yes. Uh, oh, yes. No, no, they definitely don't. Yeah. Um, and that's that's the information I have for you, and you're happy to uh, answer any questions. I have, I have some questions. Sure. Can you pull up the um, the neighboring communities again? Yeah, sure. There. What stands out to me is this fourth column that the other neighboring communities have these interim steps that building owners need to take interim mm -hmm. if they do. Uh, remodel like Lake Forest do you remodel a couple of rooms you need to add sprinklers to those rooms or offices um, right. if it's over 50% then add to the to the sprinklers throughout the building do you are you aware have we in the period during which we've had this retrofit moratorium if you will have we missed opportunities by not having that amendment something like that, that the other communities have had? Have we had people do remodels that had we had some of those provisions, we would have at least gotten part of those buildings 
Well, yes, I, mean, I, th I think for a lot of buildings, I mean, like, you know, Ted Brown's building with the fur guys in it, I think, you know, there's probably been at least, what, three out of six tenants maybe that have remodeled in, in that time. So had um, we, I think I asked the question last time, had that building been three or a mile south of where it is, um, what I understand is had we had that amendment, we, we would have, unless they'd gotten an exemption, um, would have been half of the way there already, I guess. Three of the six tenants would have been remodeled and right. presumably we would have gotten that. I'm just wondering if our, if our um, statute, our ordinance has a missing component, maybe even which we have three years until the retrofit date, maybe even which needs to go into place now because it feels like we've missed opportunities already in 12 years where, I guess 12 years, where those remodels should have been captured. Like, and hopefully the, the building owners have made the decision to make the economic decision to go ahead and put those in, knowing that the statute was here and it was coming, um, maybe make those additions along the way. Um, but I, I don't know that that's the case. But it, I'm concerned about waiting another three years and not having something like that not having the amendments that the neighboring communities have, because as these remodels happen, we ought to be getting incrementally toward our goal. Anybody have a reaction to that or response? I, I definitely agree. It seems like that's an opportunity that's logical. And in that case, the applicant is saying, may I do this X, Y, and Z, and then part of that permitting process, I believe that's a logical element to to that process, to, to, to say, let's address this issue. It's, um, it seems sort of, agreement. thank you. It just seems uh, uh, like it's a gaping hole in what we've done. We've tried to go the whole, we've tried to go for a touchdown and we've failed to get the first downs along the way. Um, I, some analogy like that, but um, that that's what struck me about this. And then the exemption process sounds, seems like it's a little bit um, of a mixed bag. It seems the exemptions process makes sense to me. I think we, we ought to have one. Frankly, I'd put the churches into the exemption process and not have them just be exempt, but maybe that ship has sailed. But um, the exemption process strikes me as as necessary and um i'm interested that not all the company not all the uh, communities have that but i am interested in what the standard is are, are we ag exempting buildings because they have like the comed power uh, building has no people in it are we exempting and so there's no loss of life um, risk or extremely minimal loss of life risk or exempting buildings because um, they only have a, a handful of people in it and three points of egress or I'm a little concerned about the exemption process though I think we need one having some sort of standard so I had that same thought about the exemption pr process what the criteria would be if you were coming forward um, because I feel like that might, um, from the standpoint of just putting more um, work on the PCZBA in the village board, if someone comes forward and says, well, now I, I like an exemption, what are, our, what are our clear criteria for those exemptions if it's not just an open building? Like I, the open building makes a lot of sense to me, right? right if it's like right. a gazebo or what have you. But if, if someone comes forward and says, this doesn't make sense for my business, Sure. Do we have some sort of criteria? Because uh, other, uh, otherwise, there's you know there's a lot of gray area in there. Sure. Um, and that, like even the time frame of how that would look uh, for the exemption process, what, what would be the steps we would go through for something like that? Yeah. So so in the draft ordinance, um, we put in um, six criteria, um, and I can read them off to you here. Um, and, and this would go to the uh, the ABR for them to uh, to vote on it. And then people, if they didn't, uh, if they thought the ABR's decision was wrong, they could possibly appeal to the village board, um, appeal that decision. 
But so the six criteria were um, any unusual or practical difficulties in installing an automatic fire sprinkler system in the building, which would be, you know, the case in like the ComEd building um, where it's all electrical equipment. Um, then the, the size and location of the building, um, and I think implied there is, is how close to other buildings, that type of thing. Um, the hazards in around the building, the occupant load and occupancy classification of the building, um, access to the building for firefighting, whether the building meets or exceeds the village code's requirements for egress and other life safety requirements, and whether notwithstanding the, our local amendments, um, whether it would be required under the International Building Code to have fire sprinklers um, today. Michael, oh, go ahead. I, I was no, just going to say, I, that's a great list. I think there were a few in there that I felt like were kind of vague, like the size and location, the hazards. Um, some of those things to me were just a little vague. I mean, <coughs> I'm just thinking down the road, like mm -hmm. when, when something like this comes forward uh, and, and the boards have to make a decision, it's, I feel like it's better to um, have that criteria be a little more specific than mm -hmm. vague from the standpoint of it helps make the decision a little more logical and a little more straightforward mm -hmm. when someone comes forward. That's just mm -hmm. my own, probably okay. my own personal feeling on that. But I, I did right. see the list. I did see okay. the criteria. Okay. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any other thoughts on that. Barb? Well, I do, I do know that the boards change over the years, and so the continuity of that decision matrix, regardless of who would be on the board, there needs to be some integrity in that. And so Joy's point about specific examples of uh, when size would merit consideration for exemption would be, and it could be an example, it doesn't have to be the only example, but it would be an illustration so that, because as the boards change and as as um, we want to have continuity that, mm -hmm. you know, oh, I got the, I got the board that, that wasn't doing their homework and I did get the board that did do their homework, you know, so they're different, mm -hmm. different results. So I, I do feel like kind of narrowing that down with perhaps a little more specific language might be helpful um, in that regard. Um, and this is not on that exact topic, but in um, the reading that we did, it was noted in terms of the financial impact for um, putting in these fire sprinklers. Some states, such as New York, um, had tax credits, and I don't know for the state of Illinois if they have historically had anything or if anything is pending, or perhaps we should you know, get something started so that there is some sort of preferential tax treatment in that you know, that type of expense can be um, taken for tax purposes right away instead of amortized over a very long time. So the cost side of it was, you know, for Illinois, is there anything special that is currently on the books or, you know, about to be on the books? And then also just exploring the idea of the special assessments, which is a different way of, um, of uh, having improvements take place by having a stronger hand in, in the municipality saying this will take place and we will in, in, in some way make that happen and then get those funds returned to us with these special assessments by the property owners who will over X amount of time pay those special assessments. So it's a stronger hand in, in making it happen in some way. Um, so both of those are just, the tax credit and the special assessments are just different ways of thinking about the financial impact of it. And um, I, I don't know if that is something that is relevant, is something that we wanna talk about, is, is it helpful? Um, and does the state of Illinois have anything like that either now or in the works for encouraging the investment in such systems. Yeah, I don't. I don't think the state has anything, but the federal government did change the tax law on fire sprinklers several years back, so now people can depreciate the cost right away on that and mm -hmm. get more out of their federal taxes for that. Mm -hmm. 
So that softens the blow a little bit. Right. And what about the, the thought that there could be a special assessment and that, again, a municipality could have a stronger hand in making something like that happen at a certain point in time and then collecting an assessment from the property owner? Is that something that we've explored or talked about or? No, it's not something we've really considered. I haven't, I mean, I guess we could do that. I have not heard of anyone doing that. It, it kind of um, seems to be difficult if it involves uh, uh, us paying for the contractor's work. Yeah, I, I don't know how that really works, but there. it's a stronger Are approach. Are talking about a special service area? Um, specifically, I, I'm going to just read, this is from the packet that we got. It says, as an example, Minnesota allows a local jurisdiction to make improvements to any properties and assess the cost to the property owners via a special tax assessment. Essentially, the local jurisdiction pays for the improvements, then recoups the cost from the property owner by assessing their taxes, and this says over a period of 30 years. So, I mean, it does, it requires the investment to come up front from the municipality, and then we collect it. I don't know if, you know, there's some implied interest rate or, you know, cost of carrying that over the years, but it's, it's a stronger approach to getting it done. Mm -hmm. And um, and we generally don't have those strong, you know, we're making yeah. it happen type. Um, yeah, I've seen that done and been part of a community that had special service areas to extend utilities, water and sewer to properties. Um, they were contiguous properties. Mm -hmm. And it's the way it's set up in Illinois, there's a certain percentage of, <clears throat> Uh, registered voters in that special service, you have to get 51% of people to go along with it. And so I think it may be difficult if these properties, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, yeah. the ability to create such a uh, special service area when these properties are not going to likely be contiguous right. makes it mm -hmm. administratively clumsy. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not, I'm not familiar with that approach. Minnesota statutorily maybe has different tools than Illinois does to, yeah. to promulgate regulatory compliance well it would seem like you'd have to take the entire population of these are the non-compliant properties and kind of whether they're contiguous or not just say they're now in this bucket of we're mandating this is going to happen and it may be that one is you know in the district right here where mm -hmm. all the buildings are boom 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 and another one is a freestanding building that's not directly touching another um, so maybe it would be that the group of candidates would be made smaller if it's freestanding and not right next to another unit. Just something like that where, or in some of these really historic towns where they'd have, you know, like street upon street of, you know, historic building. Mm -hmm. and it would kind of behoove everyone to work as a group so that, you know, if something happened in one building, the whole, you know. Yeah. If it's just every other building, then you're still exposed to that risk. Um, anyway, I just thought that was an interesting approach and I wanted to find out, you know, if that made sense, if, if at a staff level you talked about it. And maybe because I, I, the special service area tool that I'm thinking of that maybe most comparative to this similar is probably not the right tool for what yeah. you're describing. And, um, I, and maybe the, it's a timing issue too in my head. I'm trying to imagine doing that now versus at the beginning of a, of a program, giving people more time to access this pool of floors. Because so, the idea of saying, well, what about those groups of property owners that already implemented right. the program years ago? How do you sell that story to them saying, we're going to use the village's funds to implement this regulatory for those who've chosen not to do something or you know elected right. not to do it? So. It's true. So. But um, I had one other comment. Um, what what happens if this date goes by and uh, we don't have compliance? Assuming we don't, uh, what happens? I don't see a fine provision. I, I think other building code violations have daily fines. That it, I mean, it just seems to me, you know, we don't want to be fining our businesses out of <laughs> out of existence, but. It seems to me there's a mismatch between the financial incentives here and what we're trying to get businesses to do. And if the date comes and goes after 15 years, 
the date comes and goes, it seems to me some sort of, you know, every day that goes by that a fine incurred, if they don't have an exemption or a, yeah, so or a, um, a uh, I compliance. There, I thought there yeah. was yeah. a fine. Is there a fine? Oh, the, yes. Yeah, the, the whole building code has the same penalty provision. It, there's a maximum fine of up to $750 per day. Per violation. Um, per violation, yes, that's right. Per day? Per day, per oh, violation, okay. yeah. Of course, that's the maximum. A judge would set the actual amount, so the actual amount might be lower than the maximum, usually is, but. I see. Can we set a minimum? I think there might be a minimum in there. Yeah, I think it is. I think I mean, it might be $25 a day. The answer is yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Given, <clears throat> given what we're looking at up here and the idea that we don't, you know, in that fourth column, we have nothing, and then we're, we're the only community that has this hard date of, of mm -hmm. 2026. Um, ha have we talked at all about possibly changing our our approach, where we don't have a final date, and we just as peop as tenants continue to upgrade and change their um, units and and retrofit and change things, that we have something similar to Lake Forest. Well, I, I think it would have been ideal if back at the beginning of the program we'd had both, to be honest, because, I mean, the problem I think Lake Forest has is it, it works well up into a point, but then there's those buildings or tenant spaces that just never get remodeled, and then you just never, you know, then your neighbor has been forced to do it, and mm -hmm. yet you're still, you know, the potential fire hazard next door or something. Um, so it's, it would have ideal, been ideal to get both and get, you know, partial compliance all along the way, but now all this time has elapsed and we're almost to the deadline and, you know. And, and how many people have complied? I mean, what would you say percentage-wise have complied um, already? Uh, more, more than half. We, I have the... I feel like we had that number somewhere. Like 60, well, wasn't, 60%. Yeah. wasn't that initial compliance was half-ish, maybe a little more, but then since the deadline was extended, virtually no zero one. additional o only one more has yeah. done it since the deadline was extended so all of them more than half did right. it in the uh right if if we had that interim provision we could not issue a building permit right unless it included sprinklers right I, I, I it just seems to me that we ought to be doing that now and keeping the 26th date and implementing a, a exemption process so that today if anything happens between the next three years even if it's happened in 12 years the last 12 years but if anything any ex changes are made much like lake forest we capture those let's not let any more time go by on that and then implement continue to have the date the 20 the date of 1 1 26 but it, but have a, an exemption process is that possible? Is that too much to ask? Because I think it feels that sounds like we reasonable. have to have some enforcement yes. mechanism other than, come on, guys, right. you know, time's a ticking. Right. Uh, if uh, every uh, time somebody applies for a building permit, we have some ability to influence that decision, then I don't know, it seems like. Beyond that, with um, looking at page five of 72, the exemption process. The, um, some items look, I mean, we need to have that exemption process. I agree with you all. Yeah. The, what actually, reading that process, um, so churches are exempt, but again, Notre Dame bu uh, burned. So maybe we want that. But the, again, this is a financial burden on some structures, and I agree with that. The second thing is, uh, those item um, one to seven are subjective to me. Michael, is there, is there a way to actually refine this to say, you know what, people, we might end up with arguments that do not get, um, it looks subjective to me. What, can you speak about that? Yeah, well, there's advantages and disadvantages to that. There's a, there's a lot of potential, um, there's a lot of potential variety of situations because you, there's a whole different, you know, whole sets of facilities and hazards that you might end up with in different buildings. So. The advantage of getting specific is it's less subjective. The disadvantage of getting specific is you'll more likely to encounter situations you didn't anticipate. Um, so right. uh, there's, you know, it's, it's pick your poison. <laughs> Which disadvantage do you want? Yeah, I get that. Yeah. Um, 
and this is an EBR, this uh, as opposed to the page you were describing that was a staff process, in our case that would be an EBR process. Correct, that's right. Yeah, be, staff because it's a job, or, right, a staff recommendation, an ABR, an ABR meeting and decision. decision process. Yeah. Okay. So the village board would be the appeal body. Right. I would also, at the risk of pitchforks and torches, I would put churches back, back in because that's where people congregate. These terrible deaths that we read about in this packet were where people congregate. That's the real loss of life risk. And I appreciate that it's maybe Sundays and Wednesdays and not all the time. But logically, it doesn't make sense to me. I think they could come in and ask for an exemption. I think they could do it over time as they make they remodel. But to have them exempt altogether just doesn't, if we're trying to, doesn't make sense to me. So. But I, I can think of, of a couple of places in town being a, a church where they will not be able to afford a retrofit. Right. So I think they can come in and make it. And, and seek an exemption or some other way to, I think one of the standards for the exemption ought to be, have you got another, what is it called? Financial hardship. Um, well, I wasn't thinking about the financial hardship so much because other nonprofits have financial hardship. I, I, if I'm gonna make an exemption, I'm gonna make it for all nonprofits that are struggling to, to make ends meet. So, um, what I was thinking is they might be able to come in with an alternative form. Chapter 7 of our document talks about an alternative an engineered life, life safety system. They might be able to articulate or come up with a plan that yeah. is an engineered life safety system that mitigates the risk to human life, which I think is primarily our issue. And that could be a standard. That's one of the standards that I had added in my list, what what have they done, if not added the sprinklers, what have they done to mitigate risk of A, human life, B, damage to other people's property, and C, the need for our volunteer services to come out because they've let a trash can fire become a conflagration because they haven't put sprinklers in. So I know I'm open in a can of worms, but I think if we have an exemption process, we have to put the churches into the exemption process. So what I hear on the board is we're pretty much all in agreement that we need an exemption process um, with um, uh, staff, ABR, and um, the, this board being a, 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 um, a, a recall. Um, yeah. And then we have a, an engineer and life savings uh, process, as you said part of that uh, solution, part of that, uh, that exemption process as a fallback if we had an exemption. Is that what we're saying? So one detail I just wanna share about the churches, when they were exempted in 2010, there was a requirement that they have to install a full fire alarm system within I think it was three years to qualify for that exemption. Mm -hmm. So they, they did that. So it's not quite the same, it's not the same level of protection as having sprinklers, but at least they did we, something so the churches went out and did that to qualify for their exemption it doesn't the statute doesn't read that way so if we implement an exemption process because de facto that's what that was right mm -hmm. if we implement an exemption process we ought to just strike that from the ordinance and put them into the exemption process because that's an alternative life-saving engineered life-saving system that perhaps was adequate for <clears throat> the balance of interest that we're talking about, the financial hardship, the, the damage to an architectural or a um, historic building, or um, affecting the architectural integrity of a, of a, of a building. It, it does seem like it's ultimately gonna be kind of a balancing issue, but for me, <clears throat> just pulling churches out of the altogether doesn't doesn't make sense. I would put them in the exemption process and then grant them the exemption under the same terms that we granted it before. The way it reads now, it's just nonsensical to me. Well, and I just wanted to add to that conversation is that some churches are used very differently than others. Some, it's a 1.5 hour Sunday morning affair and for others, they have childcare and other programs that may be one day a week, five days a week, you know, and that's why that individual exemption process, I think, makes sense because 
mm -hmm. then you're really looking at that particular case, that particular building, how it's used, what are the occupancy levels, and is it you know, spread out, or is it really, you know, Sunday morning for 1.5 hours, and other than that, there's, you know, two guys yeah. in the office, and that's it. I, I just think that, that it makes sense. Thank you, Barb. So I think we have some, uh, some level of agreement. I would like to open that conversation to members of the public, if you want to step to the lectern. Uh, we have one more discussion after this, so I would like to limit the, the different comments to two minutes, if you guys could do that. Thank you. Please state your name and address. Also. Hi, my name is uh, Brad Anderson. I live at 511 East Prospect. Thank you very much for your time this evening. I very much appreciate everyone's volunteer efforts. I also appreciate the due diligence of village staff and the contributions of Fire Chief Graff. Before I make any fur further comments, um, Drew, I had sent Drew and Regis an email back in December, which somehow didn't go through, and I think he has distributed it. I have not. Are you going to or not? I can after this meeting. because Okay, right. no, that's fine. Okay. Um, in the email, I made several comments in opposition of the proposed amendment to the ordinance. My son Brady, who's here, and I are owners of two units in 15 East North Avenue and two units in 17 East North Avenue. Each of these buildings have three units, um, which makes them subject to the ordinance. Uh, my first objection is the burden being placed in what seems to be an arbitrary manner upon buildings with three units or more, but exclusion of single family and two unit buildings. If fire safety and protection of our residents and firefighters is the goal, why are we not proposing the same safety standards standards for the vast majority of the structures and the residents in the community. Can anyone explain why the limit was three? Because from the very beginning of this, it didn't make any sense to me that there was this line drawn in the sand at three or more units. I think my two three unit buildings, which were built in 1979, with much more current fire safety codes in place than most of our single family stock, are, are part of this ordinance, um, yet all of the duplex units in Armour Woods are not. And I think the answer is really pretty clear. If you were to try to enact this ordinance on the single family and duplex units in town, you'd have 500 people here instead of five. And it would never, it would never pass muster in the community. But is there anyone that can explain how this originated that we were trying to single out a certain type of residential dwelling over others. Yeah. You know, the, uh, um, the difference between two and three units is a traditional boundary in, from, from different codes. You know, the one and two unit buildings are regulated by the International Residential Code and three and more is res regulated by the International Building Code. So. I mean, that's been a longstanding tradition in the national codes for decades. So I think that's where it comes from. It wasn't unique to this statute or to this ordinance. Correct, correct, not really. Thank you, Mike. Sure. Well, I don't know what the international building codes are, but I don't understand how they can apply differently to two very similar residential dwelling types. Because it seems like my units, for example, are being classified in a commercial category when they're three individually, where they're six individually owned units, it's not a single development owned by one developer um, with six tenants in it. It's four individually owned properties, six individually owned, four of which are owned by Brady and I. Um, but anyways, um, there also seems to be, in my mind, and you've discussed it some tonight, a little concern for the cost of these upgrades and the burdens placed on the owners. Um, you talked about a financial burden being perhaps part of a, uh, a, a means for an appeal, and I can't see how I could make a case for um, financial need, nor do, nor do I think ComEd can make a case for financial need, yet ComEd's building is being excluded somehow, or at least planned to be excluded. Um, 
I fully agree that any structures going forward that are built um, should, should comply with whatever our current ordinances are, as was our building when it was built in 1979. But I think it's, I think it's, it's a, it's a unfair act to go back to someone after they've constructed a building and done it in compliance and then ask them to change and retrofit it. And in a re residential structure like mine, I'd have to tear out ceilings, I'd have to upgrade the water main going into both buildings. It would be a, it would be a huge cost um, for a need that I just don't see. But I do agree, and I would like to see um, a compromise made for some of these structures where you could put in a, an alarm, a fire alarm system wired directly to the fire department. Certainly the buildings on North Avenue are in close proximity to the fire department. And uh, I think that would suffice. So thank you, Brad. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Standiford. I'm a zoning attorney, and I live over uh, in Lake Forest, over near Amuncia. So it's good to be back before uh, the board. Um, I'm the uh, one of the zoning attorneys, or just uh, attorneys who uh, are, is working with one of the property owners. Give me one second here to pull up my notes. And that's the property owner at 960 West North Shore. It's over by the Ferrari. Um, this is a, a, a building that's already built out. It doesn't have sprinklers. And um, we are appreciative of the board's willingness to consider exemptions. I think that needs to be said first, first and foremost. Um, the two options that, that are, you know, that you've been discussing tonight, either the Lake Forest type exemption um, seems like a good idea, as well as the exemption that's been put forward in your packet with the criteria where you go before the architectural <coughs> review board and, uh, and make, your, make your case. So we think that both exemption processes um, would, would help with this issue. Um, Lake, I just want to point the Lake Forest exemption, uh, it's not trig the fire sprinklers uh, requirements, not trinkler, uh, excuse me, it's not triggered for cosmetic changes, I, I don't believe, such as painting, paneling, wallpaper, floor covering, repair, replacement of siding or windows or doors. So we're, they talk about significant remodeling in that. And so, um, you know, to the, to the extent, like the gentleman uh, uh, just talked about, if there was significant remodeling being done, then that would be uh, seemingly a, a, a fair requirement. Um, but the property owner in this case would ask that, you know, that the buildings that are already built like this one uh, would be grandfathered. And if, if there was any significant remodeling in the future, then compliance would be required. Um, so that's, that's the Lake Forest type exemption that, that would seem to work. Um, the uh, Lake Bluff exemption, as we'll call it, this creative way to uh, make your case before the, the Architectural uh, Board of Review. Um, like I said, it seems to be a workable solution. We talked about at the ABR, we talked about, hey, how do you implement this type of thing? And um, we think that maybe Lake Bluff would need to hire some sort of an outside fire code specialist to be consulted, to talk about, you know, to evaluate some of the applications and help staff see whether you know what we're saying is is applicable um but we think it's we think both are workable and um you know in, in this case uh, mr mccarthy owns a furrier and the sprinklers are the one thing you don't want because his product would be completely ruined so um to to not have a one-size-fits-all ordinance but have something that's that you know creates exceptions and exemptions is a really good thing for bit for business in lake forest with already uh, built buildings so uh with that uh we say thank you Thank you very much for your comments. I was trying to relate your comment to the seven exemptions. Thank you. <clears throat> Any more comments in the room? Do we have the time to go to the next item? I or think so. Well, yeah, before you leave, I think what I'll do is uh, I'll work with Mike and we'll come back at another upcoming cow and have um, not only the exemption process, but also add that 50% standard in there, that, that other requirement. And then um, as far as any other changes. Well, I see on the C1 on the exemption, potentially the nature of a business, but we make it contrary to ex exercising that business. 
I think the that's I, I, I think again my review of these that the, the it talks about the occupant load and the occupancy classification deals with who's occupying the property it addresses that by uh, nature yes. yes that might be a, a good way out yeah okay thank you the comment I had was um, the issue of hiring this outside specialist mm -hmm. I, I think there's a lot of um, very specific knowledge to this particular field that you know, it sounds like an added expense for the village to hire somebody, but it seems like it might add that layer of neutrality mm -hmm. for the ABR members um, to listen and evaluate and then have that um, be part of what is considered and, and to me an important component. Um, and I don't know if Lake Forest does that in their review process or, you know, if anybody else you know, another community that, that might do that. But um, that sounded like it would be a, a good element to add to, because I, I don't want it to be that, again, it's one board is strong and then the next board is not. One board is well-informed and then the next board is not, because we want that consistency to be there for our businesses and for our residents. So what you're saying is creating a framework that would address the subjective nature by adding an expertise related to that sub subjective aspect to make it consistent over time. Right, and I, I, again, I don't know what that cost is, but perhaps that's part of, you know, if an applicant uh, wants to seek an exemption, perhaps that, perhaps that might be part of a cost fee. Cost being borne by them. Exactly, yeah, yeah. because it, it's something that, that we will then be obliged to, you yep. know, how it works, anyway. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you. And I, yeah, and we'll, we'll talk with Village Attorney Freeman about whether that would show up in there. It's just a matter of how we do the business and with right. the escrows, like we do zoning. You know, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Can I ask, is there any process when somebody who um, is remodeling, coming in for a, um, a uh, building permit, is there any process by which they're informed <laughs> that this would be a good time for them to comply with this statute that's going to keep saying statute ordinance? that's going to go into effect in January. I just keep feeling like we ought to hold up those building permits. Michael. Yeah, we, we have been telling people that and, and including it in our plan review notes and, and in our occupancy permits too when they okay. take spaces, so, so they do know. Okay, thanks. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you wrap this up? Yep. All right, so thank you very much for these items on the, on the, on the, uh, on the agenda. I do not believe that we have a time to address the next item, the um, um, the uh, a review and update on the village affordable housing plan. And so to this, um, well, can I, may I try? <laughs> <laughs> so this is from the Tee board, from the board retreat. Yeah. The board had comments about the affordable housing and, and just really trying to update the village's plan to reflect conversations that have been going for a long time and to really just reflect changes in law, changes in practice, and changes in how the village, um, even how certain properties have developed over time that may have be, should be reflected in the plan. And so what's been put together is that, and really not much more. Um, but it, it does reflect the ongoing conversations with the city of Lake Forest. It does talk about how um, uh, the Stonebridge property has sub subsequently been developed as well as the one up in, uh, I'm sorry, not Stonebridge, but um, <laughs> yeah. still a clean slate. Um, <laughs> the one up uh, in Shore Acres, uh, next to the golf facility mm -hmm. has been developed now. So the idea of uh, reflecting those changes. So I, I don't know if there's any more comments. We can certainly, if there's questions about what was put together um, in these next few minutes, happy to try to answer those. Um, if it's, up to, if you guys want to pick it, we can start next two weeks from tonight earlier. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I, I'll just comment that it's a lot of really good work that's gone into this. Um, and I really appreciate the specificity that's here. The question I asked you earlier, I think could be clear, not that we're line editing this right now. Yeah. Um, I know it's in draft, but the phrasing of the um, applicability of the statute to us is vague and it, it needs to say not only that the General Assembly passed a statute that made it applicable to home rule communities, but it's law now. <clears throat> doesn't have that $750 day fine <laughs> included in it as I understand it or even 25 but um, I think we could be more clear that spell that out right? yeah. yeah 
yeah. But I know we're not line editing, um, but I did think that's worth worth saying because there's a lot of a lot of detail about how it didn't apply to us for years, and then this kind of oh, and now the general assembly says it does. So. I don't, I don't have any comments at this time. I mean, I read through it all, and I think at some point the board really needs to have, we should spend a, a good amount of time on this. Um, mm -hmm. And I think part of that discussion is, well, how, how serious are we about this? How big of a priority is it to the board member sitting here? Because if, if we are really serious about going from 4.3% to 6 or 7%, um, I think we're short 160 units, 190 units. There's a re even, you know, to get halfway, it's a heavy lift and, and there's big implications. So I think it, it warrants a bigger discussion. I think so too. I think we don't have enough time to address this as a, as a serious <coughs> conversation in seven minutes. So yes, but I think we should take those comments and rework them for the next session and work from there on. Barb? I agree with Steve. I think it definitely merits a larger discussion and um, it, it, it's it's kind of pointless at this time to, to start <laughs> so okay. so thank you very much for oh, that I agree Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I also agree it's good work by the, uh, by the village and I think it warrants um, <clears throat> it warrants a lot more conversation is the person that wrote the report here it was well, it's, no. it's a it's a combination of I thought it was an intern uh, Eric worked on it in the back, yes. <laughs> okay. Eric worked I, thank on you, it. Eric. <laughs> and it's built largely on the, the, the foundation of the first plan that yeah. Peter wrote. Thank you. So thank you, Joyce. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, so we motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 So, so moved. So moved. Second. Second. We did. Second. Second. There you go. Yeah. All in favor. <laughs> Complete disorder. Thank you so much. And we are adjourned. Thank you so much. Aye. No, it's good.